All right. Hello, hello. Let me just double check that we are live and we are. Hey, Edgar, how are you doing? I'm oh, good. I'm good. Pretty good. Thanks, Alex. How are you? I'm good. Um, I will start by reading some of our latest followers in Twitch. And then I'm going to ask you to talk to me a little bit about yourself and the community and your role as ambassador and everything. And then we can get started. So awesome. let me first read. I don't remember which was the last one that I read. I remember Diego and PH Mule, um, Big Nash. Yeah. And then we have Joe's turn. Thank you for following us. Then Rava. Rama Vula, then Finkel J. <laughs> I always struggle to read the users. Um, Anup Vish Sharma, CC Hale, New Mule 84, South Coast Strider 999, uh, Shu, Next Gen Nick Trader. Wow, nice one. Uh, Christian. Kosiovan and a tool 0694 three hours ago. Whoa, wow. Well, thank you for all of our new followers. I always love to see new followers on Twitch. I really, really, really appreciate it. We are almost at, at 400, actually. We're just missing two followers to reach 400. So if we get to 400 in this stream, I will be greatly appreciative of all of you. Hello. Hi. We have people on LinkedIn. We have people on Twitch. Hola, Yoni. Thank you for joining. So everyone watching, if you can just go to twitch.tv slash mulesoft underscore community, because we are streaming on LinkedIn, Twitch, and Twitter. But if you go to Twitch and follow follow us there, you will receive notifications as soon as we're live and you can see all of our previous recordings of any of our previous live streams, including stuff like Connect, Dreamforce or a TDX or stuff like that. So I really recommend you go there. And again, if I have two more followers in this stream, I will let you know who those are and I will be greatly appreciative of all of you. All right. So that's it for me. Um, Edgar, so what's up? Who are you? Let all us right. know. <laughs> so yeah, thank you so much, uh, Alex. Yeah. And thank you for uh, inviting me to speak here in, in the live stream. Uh, so yeah, my name is Edgar Moran. Uh, I've been working with Muso for like four years now, almost five. And along with that, uh, I've been just testing stuff and features from Salesforce as well. So I like to do that too. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I've been ambassador, I think for three years now, two years. I don't remember exactly, but, uh, but yeah, it's been a while. Um, and yeah, you, you, you'll see I've been posting um, a lot of just like POCs uh, or small articles. Uh, I used to post them more in my personal blog, even I still doing it, uh, I also uh, started doing it in Medium. So if you guys are reading some of the, or, or you follow the integration blog in Medium, uh, you'll see some of my articles there. Uh, you can follow me there because I post uh, from Salesforce development and also for uh, the meals of, um, you know, POCs testing, just whatever I can. I, I really like to share any kind of knowledge, but yeah, that's that's me. Awesome. Thank you so much. And can you remind me your GitHub? Oh, yeah. Let me, I think it's Imoran. Let, let me actually, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, on GitHub. You can uh, check my, uh, with Imoran. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, I love your, your readme. It looks awesome. All right. There you go. You can follow Edgar on GitHub and on his website. I put the links in Twitch. So if you go there, you will find them. <laughs> awesome. All right. Yeah. I, and just pretty quick. Um, yeah. Now that you shared the GitHub also. Um, yeah. Just you guys check out the recipes. Uh, give me ideas what else to put in there because sometimes I'm struggled to think about something is pretty easy, but uh, maybe it's worth it. So uh, I'm posting just whatever for any connector, uh, 
how to start using it in the in one single project. So I think it's gonna help. Uh, it's gonna be helpful for anything that is getting started, or even sometimes for myself for reference. I go there and how how I did, a, I don't know, a connection or something in Salesforce, for example. Uh, but yeah, that that's pretty much that. Yeah, definitely. I always go back to my content as well because then I forget how I did something, and then I just go back and see how I did it. <laughs> yeah, true. All right, Edgar, what are we going to learn today? Uh, well, uh, I, I actually, in the Medium integration blog, it got released uh, an article that I just wrote a few days back. And it's related to how we can use data with uh, and combine with Apex code, right? So uh, as we know, Apex code is uh, just the main programming language that Salesforce uses for uh, any kind of integration or features that they want to custom to maybe custom build inside Salesforce. Uh, and one of the things that I liked is like uh, DataWave uh, was announced as an open source. We have a lot of information about DataWave now, now that we are using, a, a, you know, a, a, any version of Mules, right? And then uh, having DataWave there has helped us a lot to make transformations and everything. So I think there's a lot of potential uh, using DataWave with Salesforce, just thinking about any integrations, not, not, not necessarily using Mulesat, but in the Salesforce ecosystem, people is doing uh, HTTP requests to different services and stuff, and they might be just able to do transformations that maybe they are struggling for hours and just minutes now with data with there. Now, uh, something that I, that I did is, um, it's a super simple sample, but uh, I think it's worth it just to see it. Uh, it's in preview on the beta for win uh, winter, I think, winter uh, 23 or something like that. So they put it, uh, they put data with there. It's not available or uh, fully open, uh, but you can start testing that in some versions of uh, Salesforce. So I'm gonna kind of explain that in a little bit. So I don't know if, if you want me to kind of share my, my, my screen maybe, and I can explain what what are the steps that I follow uh, in order just to, uh, you know, just, just to achieve this little POC. So- Yeah, go yeah. ahead. All right, let me see, share screen. All right, so you might be watching an empty screen. I can see it. Okay, just one sec. Because the first thing that I want to share is this little page. So there you go. So this page is the official Winter 13 release notes. And as you can see, there's a specific section on how to use data with in Apex and how to enable your data, right? Which basically means uh, how you can use Apex code in order to uh, implement some uh, scripting here, right? So you can actually write uh, or reuse your data with scripts. And from some of the data that you are receiving or reading from Salesforce, you should be able to just make transformations. And I feel this is pretty useful because sometimes whenever you're doing an integration or a connection, let's say, either it's just from a service or just from the same Salesforce information, you should be able to make some transformation. Let's say you're just reading an, a, an object or maybe you're just reading a CSV, but you want to have an adjacent just because maybe you're gonna do an HTTP request later on, things like that. But uh, I, I found this pretty useful at the beginning, but also kind of confusing, right? Because uh, from my point of view, if I think about development in Salesforce, sometimes it's like, okay, uh, whenever you have an, a Salesforce or a, and you have your ID, for example, in this case, VS Code, you should be able just to start typing some like create Apex class or you know, or create a trigger or something like that. And, it's, and it gives you a template, right? But with this preview, you don't have that. So you have to kind of do some stuff manually and there are some pre requirements, right? So the way that I, I achieved to start working on this is first of all, um, there's obviously the Trailblazer tra community. You can start asking questions there and you should be able to see uh, questions from other people. Also that I saw is like, a, there's no, much interaction just yet, right? So you see, you see me here just asking some questions as regards how to push my code and stuff like that. Um, so it, it's pretty new, but I think it's gonna start evolving once people start see the potential uh, on, on the actual scripting with data with. So um, let me see what else. I think, yeah, this they have these code samples that they are more like sophisticated, right? So in this case, it's more like, um, there's a bunch of, 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 of uh, not just sample, but how, how you can actually reference the, the, the scripting. Like you have some classes here, and this is how they are calling, for example, data with from here, 
right? There, there's some stuff in here that you probably is not worth to explain, but um, um, what is interesting is that you have a folder for just your data with uh, scripts, right? So all of these guys already li live in Salesforce, right? So ho ho the way it works is you need to create a, a specific Salesforce instance uh, or, or prepare your environment in order to start using this or, or start doing a POC, right? So in, in the Salesforce ecosystem, there's something that is called uh, a scratch org. So basically it means you have a Salesforce org or developer instance. <laughs> Sorry. And in that developer instance, uh, you can set it up as a dev hub. And that means a dev hub is basically a, a container, let's say, just where you have all your Salesforce trial ors, developer ors, or a scratch ors. Right, scratch ors are mainly used for developing packages, so you can start releasing new versions uh, or new features, and they are disposable. So that means that you have a limit of time to use them, and the max time for those are 30 days, and, and so on. Right, but basically allows you to create a feature. You basically release that feature into your stay in environment or something like that, your sandbox environment, and you can dispose that scratch or so mainly is for release management. I, I, I'll see like that, right? Or testing new features like this. So let me open my actual project. Let me actually find it, sorry about that. I wasn't fully prepared for, for sure. That's the, fine. The whole thing. <laughs> That's me all the time. <laughs> all right, but no worries. We always overcome the challenges, right? So, um, okay, so I'm gonna share this. Uh, this is VS Code and Probably what I can do is uh, kind of emulate what I did, right? So you guys kind of get a sense what it means to create a scratch or two. So let me actually create a new, a new, just empty project here. And what I do is I I always do like Shift Command P just to show the palette, and that uh, that is gonna give you the whole commands for Salesforce. Something prior to that, sorry, and I forgot. Uh, we have some extensions, right? And in order to make this work. And there's a couple of things that you need to do. And the first one is to have the Salesforce plugin installed. These guys, the Salesforce CLI integration and extension pack uh, and expanded, these guys, right? And along with that, there's a, an, Ape, an Apex CLI tool that is installed in your computer. Basically, it's a, it's a program running in order you can you can start typing some commands for uh, Salesforce CLX or, the, or Salesforce DX, for example, all right? So you have that already installed. So now we can just start here. And in the menu, you'll see like a, a DS, FDX uh, commands, basically. And you can create a new project here, for example. I cre just create project. And from here, we select a standard project. And I'm going to put, I don't know, uh, I'm going to put your sample, sample, right? And I give just a location I'll put the project here. And as you can see, automatically the scaffold of the project is here. There's some information here. There's a lot of uh, loading. It takes just probably a few seconds, but basically once it's there, um, yeah, you, you, you already have that template, right? And there's other things that you need to consider. So we have this config file, or the config folder, sorry. And inside this config folder, we have the project scratch definition. This is basically how your uh, scratch org is gonna be created. It means uh, which features do you want to test in here? So as you can see in here, it only has the enable set password, password API, for example, but there's more things, right? In the Salesforce uh, ecosystem, you can include, maybe you want to try field services, you want to try, I don't know, a feature that only is available for someone that is paying for that feature at some point. But in here, because it's disposable, you, you are able to actually use them test that out and see how it looks like given in Salesforce, right? So uh, the only trick in order to start using a data whip with this is to uh, include this piece, data whip in Apex. So you can copy this, I'm gonna copy this. I'm gonna put it in here. Uh, I don't remember if it's just, yeah, the separate element. So I can do a comma, data whip in Apex, and, and that's it, right? So I save this guy under the control S, the next step is you have the definition of your scratch org. So now let's create one. Um, something that I mentioned in the article is you need to have a dev hub, right? So in order to have a dev hub uh, uh, enable, basically you need to create a dev org. That dev org needs to be uh, needs to be set up as a dev hub in this case. There's some check marks that you need to include. 
and automatically there's another package that gets installed and you're able to start creating those scratchers. I, I'm not going to do that because it takes a very long time. I already have one. And then in your local project, basically Salesforce DX has a command to uh, set up that dev org, right? And you said, this is my default uh, dev hub that I'm using. I want every single scratch or, or instance get created under my, my instance or my main instance, right? So in here, my next step there is pretty much just like uh, I'm going to do a, a create a default scratch org, right? This is the option. So if I click in here, it's selecting by default the same file that I just edited. And I'm going to put the same name, sample. It's an identifier. And in here, it's asking you how, how, for how long do you want to have this org? I'm going to just put like seven days, which is fine. And as you can see, the CLI is just running. And so in here, we can see what is happening behind the scenes. All right, so let me actually make this a little bit bigger, still working. It takes probably, I don't know, a minute or something like that. But when it's, if, once it's finished, it's going to tell you that Scratch or is created, right? So let's just wait a little bit because after it's getting created, I want to open the actual instance that, that was spin up. Um, what is getting created, actually, in the meantime, I'm going to do this in here. So you can, once, let's say, the scratch or got created, we can do a, a command that is called open default org. So I'm going to just do that. And what it does is, is to open Salesforce. So let's see if I if it is doing it. So Salesforce gives you this kind of weird domains, but they are spin up just on the fly. So this is in a scratcher. So this is Salesforce, right? And let's say it's just a, a regular instance, but on, on behind the scenes, it might have more features, right? So someone someone with paid subscriptions or something might see some of the uh, elements or objects or, I don't know, applications. You should be able to see them in here, right? Um, at the very end, um, what I did on my sample also was, um, let me just go back to studio. Well, the other is still working, right? So I'm going to explain over the same project that I did. Um, once I have all of this created, let's say the, the con I validated my scratch or what created and I can see the instance. What I did is um, I just wrote a pretty simple um, uh, script in here, right? But before that, um, I thought in my mind, because this is my thought process too, right? Like, okay, once I I have everything ready. What is the next step? So I need to think about in a scenario in Apex. I couldn't find anything like, you know, like like makes sense. But for myself, it was like, okay, let's just hit a public API. I want to retrieve whatever it has, and I'm going to just map it to a couple values in here. How I did that is like basically I created this Apex class called REST Service Consumer, GW, which basically is just a a Apex class in Salesforce that has one method that is called consume. And what it's doing is an HTTP request to this uh, this API, which basically only I'm pulling a couple records in here, right? So it has a, a JSON format. It doesn't have any authentication or anything, right? But for now, it's going to just allow me to make the testing. So going back is, I'm going to explain what, what the, this code is doing. Uh, and, and, and it's pretty straightforward. So you can see we're creating an instance of an HTTP call. We are going to capture the HTTP request. We are telling where, with what endpoint, and which kind of HTTP request is. It's a get. What is going to happen with the response is I'm going to just check whenever I receive the data. Is it 200? OK, just move on. If it's something else, I, I should just capture the errors, but I just did it, right? <laughs> Super bad practices been called. But anyway, it was just a testing. Um, whenever the information comes in here, so this is where this, the, the actual magic start happening, right? So we need to have a map. Uh, the map basically is going to capture parameters, right? We're going to call it parameters, but it's just basically a key value map. So we are going to capture a, a key, and the value can be anything. But why we are doing that? Because in the data with uh, a script, that's what we are defining, right? We are defining an input, which is the incoming JSON. Or maybe we had a variable that is also part of the parameters that we are receiving, right? That's information that we are going to use for the mapping in the data with a script. So um, what I'm doing here is basically just saying, OK, I'm going to pass this incoming JSON, which you can see is the same 
as in data with, I don't know what is now opening the other one at the same time. Okay, there you go. So um, this incoming incoming JSON is this parameter, right? And what I'm putting in here is just the full response, which is the JSON, right? So just the JSON format there. And then you start creating this object, which is uh, the data with script. Uh, basically you look at the name of script and we are gonna just create it, right? And this is the name of our script that we are gonna call the JSON2 objects, which is the name that we have over here, you see? Now, we want to capture the result somewhere, which is this data wave result. That's another object uh, that exists in Salesforce. There's an end space for that. Uh, and it has some attributes, obviously. And, and the whole result is gonna get captured in here. So once the data wave uh, gets executed, the output is gonna be captured in here and we're gonna collect it and we should be able to read the response in here. Now, reading the response is not really a big deal, right? I think once the transformation happen, everything is just great and, and you have information, but there's something about uh, casting the data, but basically serializing everything, right? Something that I found in here challenging is I couldn't make a dynamic uh, list of a, a custom object, right? We call it like wrapper, from a wrapper class, I can build my own object or I can create something on myself. I couldn't do that. So what I did is I just created a lead in somewhere I read like a, it only accepts a Salesforce objects or S objects in here, which, which at some point I think is fine, but eventually we might need to have a feature to handle those custom objects that we create. Custom object as a Java object or wrapper class that we created, right? In the end, what I'm doing in here is pretty simple. So I'm just creating a list of leads, uh, just like for a lead. I'm casting it to be a, a list of leads, and I decentralize some type. That's it. Reading from the JSON, I just convert this into an object or a list of objects, and I'm just printing out this stuff, right? How do I test this is working? Uh, in in the Salesforce project, you have a section called scripts. I create I created this Red Server Apex script, which ah, it doesn't have anything here. One second. I'm just gonna just delete it. Let me put something in here. So we have this anonymous uh, executor of code. So basically you can run or, or make calls to classes that you have created and you can actually see the information. So let me do that now. So what we can do is we can just make an instance of this guy. It's here. I can do that consume. That's it. I, I click on run execute and you see it's running and from the output over here we should be able to see what happened let me clear this output oh let me just run again sorry oh there you go sorry so once you run the the anonymous script it's going to execute the whole rest service it call the HTTP endpoint it, it passed the data through data with it responded and what I'm just Printing here is couple leads. So you can see I have, well, first of all, going back to the class. Um, oh, sorry. Going back to the uh, script in data with is I just created a, a company and first name. Th these are standard fields for a lead, for example, right? So I'm mapping the title for render, which is doesn't make sense to be for a company or for a first name but I just mapped it like that, right? And as you can see for company, I'm getting this information, Gmail, we no longer, this is a, a, an endpoint that is consuming data for um, the dead crunch, for example, right? Any article that is just there is just retrieving the data. And then first name is just an ID. But you can see here, like from uh, the service, we are pulling that information, which is pretty much what we need, right? We need to know how we can read from an endpoint how we serialize the data and how we catch the output and, and how we kind of set up to be used for another process, right? So pretty much is, I'll say the PLC is pretty straightforward, but, but, it, but it, means, it means it's working. Uh, something that I wonder at some point is how to make this, uh, uh, or how to create a more complex scenario, right? Because right now it doesn't have anything. I want to see filters, I want to see how I can use maybe a plug, how I can use functions, uh, something like that, right? For now, I, I think it was just great for myself and I, and I think it was good to see like it was working. So 
yeah, I, I don't know. It, a lot of ideas might come about this, but uh, I don't know. I, I don't know if anybody has any questions or, or you find this interesting. So are there any questions from LinkedIn or Twitch? Just feel free to send them in the comment section or in the chat in Twitch. Um, and we will ask Edgar about it. From my side, I have never seen Apex. So this is the very first time that I see it and it's super interesting. Um, I didn't know, like, it was so complex. I thought it was more straightforward, to be honest. So oh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's nice to see it. I, I mean, straightforward. actually, this is, it, it, I mean, if a self-developer self developer sees this, this code, it's going to say, ah, it's just super easy, right? Uh, growing triggers. It, it's a matter of get used to, right? It, it, I'll tell you, for example, you, Alex, you write a lot of uh, data with for others, and I'm pretty sure for self developer, they'll say, you're a rock star on data with. It's going to be complex for them. But um, but yeah, uh, in the end, we can achieve a lot of things with, with this. Um, and little by little, there's a way that we can connect these this scripts or these uh, programming languages to to others, right? Like, like data with, and start just connecting the dots with, okay, Salesforce and Microsoft is getting together more and more that they are merging in some way, right? So, um, yeah, I, I think it's, it, it's great, yeah. Awesome. Well, how do you normally use Apex? What is it for, actually? It, it, well, it, it's for everything. I'll say, if you're, a Salesforce, uh, uh, you're in Salesforce, let's say, and you don't use Microsoft, uh, and that is another scenario. You have a lot of people that use Salesforce, right? And in order to handle your integrations, you use Apex for that. Uh, you have triggers. Triggers basically allows you to uh, set up actions, right? Like whenever a record change and or get updated or deleted, you run something else, a, a, a secondary action, right? It can be synchronous or asynchronous. Okay, what what it does? Like maybe uh, you're running a process, for example, right? Like uh, a trigger may call another Apex class that actually is, I don't know, let's say programming a set of, um, or scheduling appointments for someone in their in, her, in their calendar, for example. So you are writing logic for uh, a person or for a record uh, based on other parameters. You are combining the data. So it's just a full programming language, just a Java, for example. It, it's actually based in Java, um, but it has a lot of potential. You can do callouts, HTTP requests. Uh, you can create your own applications as well. Uh, I, I, I have the chance to do a lot of... Uh, Salesforce stuff in the a few years back, so uh, a lot of ISV work as well. So ISV means like publishing applications on the app exchange, which for us will be the exchange piece, right? So um, there's no custom connectors, but custom applications built on Salesforce that you can actually just kind of say install and that's it, right? So it can do whatever you you want, for example. But uh, that, that's the fun thing. So I have a lot of ideas in the future on how to make. Uh, a combination between Salesforce and Microsoft. So, for example, I don't know. I was just uh, brainstorming and say, okay, what about to have a model in Salesforce where you can see your applications uh, from Microsoft in inside Salesforce? So, what is the status of my applications? Maybe I want to see, I don't know, logs or something like that. So, uh, there's a lot of work to do there, but there's a lot of ideas that we can uh, come up with. Uh, and Apex is really powerful. I I, I feel like. Um, but in the combination with a uh, mule at some point, it makes just completely sense. And it's, it's just really, really golden for, for any, any business, I'll say. So if you didn't use data with code right here, how many lines do you think would be added? Uh, well, and, and this is a pretty bad sample, but probably I will just use one, right? And, and I'll say this. Uh, the, the, the thing or the fact of using data with it doesn't have to be to catch a straight responses, right? The straight response is pretty much a JSON that you can just pretty much deserialize in here, right? With this line, this line of code. But if uh, we are thinking about a, a huge amount of data, and maybe not that huge, but some amount of data where you want to apply some filtering of logic, that can be done in here, and you can avoid just to have the whole another function in Apex, for example, or another class that is doing what data group does in a couple lines, uh, it might take more in, in Apex code. So I, I, I feel like uh, the value is on filtering, transforming the data that we are reading, because also imagine that we are, I don't know, calling a subservice with some XML responses, and we need to grab a lot of that data. I think 
data will completely make sense. We can do that pretty easily, and the, the serialization will be super faster as well. So, um, yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. Do you have any yeah. other example? No, that's the only thing that I've done so <laughs> far. Uh, to, I, I want to I, I want to do some more complex uh, a, a scenario with XML, for example. That would be interesting interesting or maybe something with images or a big csv file so just to load kind of uh, how long it takes to process a lot of data because sometimes we we work with a lot of data too so that that'll be interesting for now it was just like uh, for fun just to see how it works make it work <laughs> initially um so yeah uh, there you go that's what i have and do you have this code in github i think it's there actually yeah let me let me see so I have a bunch of oh, where it is. Oh yeah. Let me let me sh let me share that here. So I have this here. So data with in Apex, Imoran, data with an Apex sample, and is the other repository with a whole bunch of samples as well. But I just documented this, and anybody can use it, but also it's this other bunch of uh, samples that you can still use. And you know, um, start testing now, right? Like it's a matter just to follow a little bit of the instructions, uh, making your own and data with transformations, and just see what, what we we can get. But this thing, I think, is the initial step for the start uh, creating big transformations. So I think it has a lot of potential, and I think like we can push it a lot just for uh, just for because the Salesforce developers also might be. Uh, rejecting it a little bit at the beginning because it's new and they can say it's easier to do it in Apex. So I think there's there's a, a way to to say yes, but you can do this pretty quick uh, using data way. There should be some scenario that we can put in the debate <laughs> and people can just start getting more about data way. And I think it's, it's, it's getting more popular. So it, it has to be. Yeah, I remember some Mule 3 projects where people wanted to use either Java or Groovy instead of using DataWeave because they just like, it's the same thing, right? They don't know DataWeave and they're familiar with Java or Groovy. So it was just easier for them to create a Groovy script or create a Java class and just do everything in the other languages. But at the end of the day, DataWeave is, is super, very performant and fast and everything. So I think it's just easier if you just spend a few days, weeks learning data weave, and then you will start doing more complex stuff in way less time. So yeah, I I can I can hear that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Th that's the that's the way in the future, you'll see. Yes. And now that it will be becoming open source, like the possibilities of everything that will happen, I'm just so excited. <laughs> Yeah, same here, same here. All right, so we still have 30 minutes. Is there something else that you want to try, maybe? Uh, I don't have anything in mind, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, no, but I think this is worth it, uh, just uh, showing you guys how, um, how to use it. Um, I'll say just if someone is really interested and see, start asking questions on, on, on the training uh, groups or in the community groups as well. Uh, I I wonder how many I mean which, which what a scenario actually makes sense right so let let's say a, a real scenario like we are struggling with certain thing it takes very long time how we can optimize it just trying here kind of emulate the same thing uh, same amount of data even and see and see how it works and see how it performs because I think that's what actually is gonna give more value more, more than the actual small POC right well great um. Maybe you want to show us any of your recipes in the last three minutes that we have? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's not like uh, I have a lot of things here. Like, I mean, it's great. I see the people is actually liking in the, the repository, which is great. Um, yeah, for myself, I think it's just, uh, you know, I, I like to focus more on the Salesforce piece uh, just because I kind of know better Salesforce. Um, but you can see, for example, I have a data web section, which at some point it didn't make much sense because you already have one as well. So you can, ha and you have, you have all the compilation. So I didn't put more there. I have this uh, on the Salesforce. I mean, I have book API version two, which is great for faults that are 
just sending data uh, or inserting data into Salesforce. And something important. So for the recipes, I'm trying just to put in a small explanation about what I'm doing and a screenshot. And you can try it by yourself, just pulling the code in your local environment, uh, putting your Salesforce credentials as dev environments, and that's it, right? You can start testing out of what is actually working from my side. Uh, I have the same for Bull Query uh, version one, how to consume Apex Red services, for example. Uh, that is important because they, I, I, this is this is a nice one actually. So look, uh, how many times we? Uh, what is the initial thought when you say you have to consume a REST service from someone, and automatically you think in an HTTP request, right? HTTP connector, and say, okay, I'm gonna make an HTTP request, and that works, right? That is great. In Salesforce, uh, someone might have created a custom REST service, right? And if you use the HTTP uh, request from Mule, you have to include also the authorization, right? In order to do the authorization, you need to run a couple more steps, which is generating your access token, using your consumer uh, key and secret, and that's it, right? Using the, the Salesforce connector straight, you can just use the same uh, built-in authentication. So it's, I think, you're, you're saving in a st uh, one step there. So someone create a service. This is how you create, a, by the way, a, a REST service in, in Apex. Pretty simple one. But basically, you are just getting uh, contacts, accounts with their contacts, for example, right? Uh, this is their service. It's going to be a GET. And then um, I, I also create just a post. How do you create records uh, into this uh, custom object external request, for example? The way it works is uh, in order to to invoke the get service, uh, you, you can use the connector. There's, a, there's an operation for that. And I'm gonna just open here the code. And as you can see, you have the invoke Apex REST method operation, right? Which is, 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 is uh, pretty straightforward, but not too straightforward because nobody actually had a lot of documentation on this. Um, you, you need to specify what is the class name, the Apex class name that you want to, to hit so you need to be in touch with the person that developed the, the service, right? And then there's this weird way to actually instance what do you want to get, which is a, okay, the create external request is the service. This external request is the URI that you are going to use. Uh, it can be an HTTP post. Well, this is the post, sorry. Um, what is it get? Oh, actually, is a, I did the post here. And then you invoke the Apex uh, REST method. So the thing here is, is you just are passing certain information in here uh, with data with, you are calling your uh, external uh, REST service in Salesforce, but you don't have to pass authentication. Uh, and I wanted just to demonstrate how to use this uh, because this is a really weird way to send parameters, but either way is how the Salesforce connector does. There's not much documentation about that. so. There you go. <laughs> it's the kind of things that I that I want to share here, right? Like, okay, someone didn't know how to. I just put it in here, right? Uh, and just like this one, there's other um, content document, for example. Content documents. Sometimes we struggle and say, okay, okay how do I create a a, a document in, in Salesforce? And sometimes we go and think about the actual document object and attachment, which is completely different about content document, right? Content document has versions. It, it supports bigger documents, for example. So this is the way, right? You, you create a request, you use these uh, libraries or the core libraries for binaries as well. You post the information and then you can see it in Salesforce, kind of that, right? And then the sample, there's someone else uh, actually writing about it. So I, I'm also putting information who wrote about that. So I'm just putting my version there, but someone priorly did their work in their own post in here. So we are able to actually look in, in here in details as well. So I, I don't want to take much, much time writing for someone that already did. So better put the link and I'm just doing the same and demonstrating how it works. So you can grab it and use it. So kind of that, but yeah. <laughs> it's super complete. I love it. <laughs> and we need to just keep keep uh, putting stuff in there, right? Make it a growth. Uh, I think it's good compilation. And and something funny about here is like, I grabbed this guy from the, uh, the idea from someone posting Apex recipes. So there's some there's an actual repository with all Salesforce Apex uh, recipes, someone writing code about all the things that you can do uh, in, in Apex code, for example. And, and I said, why, why not we can do something similar here, right? So, and I think it's worked. So 
Uh, it's been working, still work in progress, but uh, and, and, and I'm waiting for people to collaborate too. At some point, uh, anybody that is interested, I'm open to just receive any pull request. Just uh, I'll, I'll merge it and, and we put it in there. And the very end is just for, for the people, I guess. Yeah, that's awesome. So if anyone were to add a pull request, they have to create a folder inside source main mule. Yeah, correct. And, and just the convention. I I don't have that documented yet, but basically it's um, under uh, uh, these guys, right? It's a folder for everything. The Salesforce that I weave. I was thinking because I know NetSuite a little bit, but I don't have in in a trial account for NetSuite or Sandbox account. I, I can't write about it, right? If I had someone share it, I'll I'll do some nice post there too. Um, but yeah, you have just create a folder if it doesn't exist. Put your code, uh, and yeah, that is just to have a folder that uh, with the name that the operation that you're doing or whatever you are building and inside your code and a readme. The readme basically is just the description, some screenshots of what it does, uh, probably steps if you need to, but pretty much is that. So no, nothing really fancy, but uh, something that makes sense, just anything that makes sense, uh, we should put it in there. Yeah. Sounds good. Awesome. There you go. We still have 20 minutes, though. <laughs> Is there something else that you want to do? I don't have anything else, Alex. Sorry about that. <laughs> OK. Um, so people watching, is there something else that you want us to try? Uh, maybe you have questions about Dweave or Apex um, or anything Salesforce and MuleSoft that Edgar can answer for you? Because I'm not very familiar with stuff from Salesforce. So Edgar is here to answer your questions. <laughs> yeah, something we can try out. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, that's a pretty good idea. If someone has some scenario, I can kind of try to uh, build something from scratch pretty quick uh, and see how it works. What if you show us one of your recipes so we can see it in action? Perhaps. Yeah. yeah, totally. Let me actually open Mule because I don't have it open. Um, and yeah, let me just grab this here. Okay, just a second. All right. So, um, yeah, there you go. So you can see I have. Uh, already my project imported in here. This is the actual project where I'm uh, posting the, the recipes, right? If, and the, and, the way, and the way it works for myself is like, um, I, I don't know, I, I just think about something to share. Sometimes it's like I'm looking into the palette and see what connectors we have, what operation makes sense to, to use. Um, but yeah, in the end, what I do is uh, kind of this thing, like, uh, OK, recursive pagination. And, and let me just actually run the project, and we can see how they work, right? Um, let me see from the Salesforce, actually. This is interesting. OK, I, actually, I can probably talk about this guy, which I think is pretty useful. So it's, it's pretty simple, but uh, we need to think about how we can use uh, functions or potential from both sides, right? Like, for example, you, you have Salesforce as a platform, and you have MuleSoft, which is going to read from them, but you want to make stuff easier on your side too, right? Like, whenever you're reading from us, uh, an API, and, and us as engineers sometimes say, oh, you know what? This API is great. It has everything that I need. And sometimes it's like, oh, my gosh, this API just sucks. I, I don't like it because it doesn't have anything. I'm just pulling data. And maybe it, has, uh, it doesn't have any filters, pagination, or something like that. So it, it's not great for us because it, do it doesn't give us like a lot of tools. And what I like about Salesforce is like they include a lot of uh, functions, a lot of things that we can use and, and actually this sample, for example, the, the SQL query offset limit, right? So how many times we, we, we from databases are, or how, how, how many times we want to paginate our APIs, right? There's sometimes the way that uh, MuleSoft is just being used as a proxy, right? We are just calling third-party services, and that third-party service already have everything in place, and that's fine. 
But what about reading from databases or other systems, uh, let's say your legacy systems, for example, they don't have them, right? So we had, we need to build it. And what I meant about like, like for the Salesforce piece is, is this, like imagine that we need to query some cases, right? Some records from case object. Uh, cases is just uh, an object uh, and that's it, right? So what I'm gonna do or gonna show in here is, and uh, we, we can just write a pretty simple query, like give me an ID name, creation date. Well, if I say cases and I'm just pulling for account. It can be for any object, right? I, I'm pulling just case, uh, account. No, cases, case. I'm just do for case, order by, and we are receiving some, um, some parameters in here. How we want to have the data order. Um, we have a sort order parameter, the limit and an offset, right? So, Salesforce already used those uh, parameters, right? So you have from Salesforce already an order by operation. You have a limit and you have an offset as well. The offset is gonna tell you basically which data you want or from which record do you want to start retrieving the data or continue retrieving the data. That is gonna allow you to play around with the limit and, and, and the offset in order to start paginating the information too, right? So from this guy, let me see, just kind of redeploying, sorry about that. So you see here underneath, I have this order by, and I'm just like using uh, any attribute that I'm passing from the HTTP request. It, it can be done from Postman, right? Um, but it's important to mention that I'm just defaulting those values as well, right? So for example, sort by which field, create a date, this is the default one. Um, which order descendant, for example, the limit on the on the query that I'm doing, 20 records, and the offset default value is zero. So if I'm retrieving, uh, let's say from 100 records, I'm retrieving uh, from the, the 100 records, uh, 20, 20 records per page, and let's say it's gonna get uh, multiple offsets, right? So you're gonna start just looping through those offsets at some point. But this is just for giving the pagination back to the RPAs for some reason it's just complaining here. Sorry about that. I don't know why. Um, but in the end, that's that's what I'm trying to achieve, right? So it's you have um, that in in the recipe, for example. Let me go back into the recipe pretty quick. Um, yeah, there you go. So in the recipe, if I go back to the actual explanation, uh, I'll do better there. <laughs> so yeah, so you have in here, for example, this information, obviously I, I pulled part of this information from the um, actual uh, official site uh, and it's a better explanation how it works, right? I explain in here, how you also define your RAML as well, right? Because in the, in the very end, you have this exposed in MULE. This is the implementation, but how do you have that in, in, in RAML as well? So I, I put that here, not in the actual recipe. So I sent just in, in the description, which I think I should do some RAML recipes as well, maybe, because that'll be important. So um, we're defining some query parameters, sort by if it's required or not. I, I guess any none of them are required, and I'm just defaulting the values there, right? Sort order, the offset, and limit. And that's it, right? So you have the RAML with the query parameters as a trait. And then you have it in here, just using that trait called pagination, for example. And that's it. So you are pulling the data and and that's it, right? So that's what I'm trying to do. Just basically a quick, pretty quick sample of that. Uh, and I think someone might be find that helpful, right? And this is just one scenario. Uh, I remember I, I posted something about the get updates and retrieve. And this is for, let's say, replication jobs as well, right? Replication jobs and, and instead of start making queries in Salesforce and saying, give me everything where last day or last modified day or create date, something like that. We don't do that anymore because there's an API that Salesforce provide that nobody talks about sometimes. And it's just getting updates. Get updates gives you all the information that you need that was created or updated in, in a time frame. Um, there's limitations always as well. Salesforce or any platform has their limitations. So in this case, you can just retrieve uh, 600,000 records at a time, 
or you only can uh, retrieve data from the last 30 days, no more than that. So, and that's what a replication job does too, right? Like you are rep uh, replicating data every day, every hour, every 30 minutes, it doesn't matter. So, but no, no more than a month, for example, right? It, that's a different thing because it's not replication, it's more like an ETL job. Um, and that's what I'm trying also, again, to specify in here. So how you can use those operations, you can use them and, and how to implement them into your project. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything like, for example, would be interesting to implement that I haven't shown here. Uh, we still don't have questions regarding this, but yeah, now that we have uh, this, let me put it again, github.com slash amoran. If you just go there, you can create a pull request in, what was it, MuleSoft recipes. So you can, like, if you have any other juice cases that maybe something you use a lot or something that can be useful for others, um, it's great if you can just go and create your own code there. So yeah, I think this was super useful. And there's also the Medium blog um, where Edgar created the Dealweave and Apex code and everything. Oh, there's a question about Salesforce. <laughs> How can one get started with Salesforce development? Ah, nice. So yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I think Salesforce has grown very, very a lot, like, like in the last uh, five years, I'll say. So the best way to do it is um, Trailhead, right? So for myself, I, I found Trailhead is, is a really, uh, actually the only place for uh, training purposes that you can use, which is free. And it's, and it's great because uh, they have these kind of paths, right? Like uh, which path do you want to go? Do you want to be a developer? Do you want to be a Salesforce administrator or, or an architect, for example, right? And you choose the path. And once you have it in your mind, like, okay, now based on what you want, uh, we're gonna give you the, the actual trail that you need to follow, right? And you start uh, just grind uh, small things. Like for example, getting to know the platform, what, what is an object, how do you create those fields? How do you start using some uh, validations and stuff like that? So Trailhead gives you those, those uh, models that you can start, uh, you know, just working, understanding and they give you the quiz, right? Like, okay, did you get it? Okay, let's make a quiz for that. And if there's an exercise, they spin up on the fly a an environment that you can use later on and you can put all those features there, right? Like uh, you can actually do it yourself and, and there's a validate challenge, right? Like uh, you can click the button and say, okay, Salesforce start running their, their stuff and, and they say, okay, you pass and you did a great, you passed. So that, that, that encourage people, uh, I'll say, just to continue learning. Um, it gives you samples, pretty good samples and explanations. There's a bunch of videos uh, and it depends, right? Like if it's an administration, you'll get the models just for administrations and you can do stuff in Salesforce. If it is for development, you, you have to spin up your prey locally, you start writing some code, pushing that code into Salesforce and Salesforce will validate that you did great and, and that's it, right? But it's a process. I'll, I'll say it takes some time, but it's great because uh, on, on my time when I started, there was no trailhead. There was like some small blog posts that people start doing it. Uh, and this is just great. I think uh, everybody can learn uh, this super easy, right? Um, I think also for that is like Musoft, right? A lot of people don't know Musoft and from trailhead, they, they're starting just building those modules. So you can actually know about Musoft, how it works. And, and you have the challenge and, and it's better, right? Like a, there's there's the two ways, right? Like a, right now we are, uh, or, or the question is just how to know Salesforce, but also uh, the other way around, right? People, how, how can know uh, Mule? And I know there's a lot of things going on in the Mule uh, training as well, uh, or in the Mule uh, training part. So that, that, that'll that be something great to have too, because people will be encouraged to continue learning from the Mule uh, ecosystem in this case, but yeah. So if you already know MuleSoft and you want to learn Salesforce, um, would you become a Salesforce developer or is it just anything that you want? Oh, sorry, can you repeat that? If you're a MuleSoft developer you're, if, and you want to learn Salesforce, do you have to go through the Salesforce developer path or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so for example, right in here, Trailhead. So we're going to Trailhead. Um, uh, we can see here the trails. Well, there's something about career paths, for example, 
right? So if we went to career paths, you can see like, okay, you can be a selfless administrator, selfless developer, an architect, and so on, right? Like you can pick whatever your interest is. If you want to be a developer, for example, here, selfless developer, and you, you can start from here, right? Like, uh, well, there's no it's open positions, but there should be somewhere here, the actual trailer, right here, starts cleaning up. Okay, there you go, starts cleaning up. And then here you have a, a small trail, right? Which is they're giving you some links and then you can start actually just completing these models. It gives you like, okay, do you know, we're gonna start with the Latin web components, for example, right? If you open the model, it's gonna give you a few of them. It tells you how long it's gonna take you to complete them. And it gives you the whole explanation and how to set up, I don't know, the environment. It gives you videos, samples, and you have this option, right? Like uh, to validate the stuff, uh, maybe not this one, but let me see. So for example, this guy here, it tells you how to create your project in VS Code, how to write the code for a Latin web component, how to push it, and then you you validate that this is correct, right? Um, and yeah, that, that's pretty much that. I mean, again, it's, it, it, it takes some time and, and you can just go here directly. And instead of actually looking at the career path, you can look for models that you are interested in, not, not just that career path, but you can just look into these models. And the other thing is you, you start earning badges, right? So there's kind of a ranking too at some point, like you start just creating your profile obviously just for that, but then you start earning the badges and points, right? And you can get like, a, okay, you are ranger, you are double ranger. I think there's like a bunch of uh, uh, kind of ranks at this point, but it's for people that is just here, uh, just spending time learning, uh, you know, uh, it's a matter of spending a lot of time reading and, and completing challenges. But I think the most important thing is understanding pretty much what you're doing, right? And for myself, it's more like um, what you're doing. And, and if you are working actually in Salesforce or you have a lot of relation with Salesforce is where you need to understand, right? Okay, because if imagine that you have a project with someone that knows a lot of Salesforce, you are from Microsoft, but you don't want to say something nonsense. So basically, you know what you're talking about. And okay and you know like also the capabilities right if someone tells you like oh we can do this it's like okay man but we can probably do this other thing so at least you know which other paths we have for for something right to to create a, an application or an integration i don't know but yeah this is the way awesome i think there are no more questions feel free to ask any other questions that you may have um but yeah, I think this was great, Edgar. Thank you so much. And I know it was last minute. <laughs> so uh, no worries. I'm really happy to, to do it. Thank you so much. Yeah. So yeah, remember you can go to Edgar's website, yuselmoran.com, and you will see all of his articles and stuff. And he also has a medium. Um, is your medium there in your website? Uh no, I don't think so. Let me send it that to you. Um, yep, pretty quick, just one second. Yeah. And there's also the GitHub, um, Emoran, so you can go there and see all of the recipes and all of the code samples that Edgar has. And let me put the medium one, hold on. There you go. So you sell moran.medium.com. There you can find, um, again, more articles that Edgar creates. And you can also follow uh, the Another Integration blog, if you're familiar with it, from uh, our community. You can talk to Sabrina Hockett if you want to get your article posted there. And that's it. Thank you so much, Edgar. I don't see any more well, questions. So we're going to leave it there. Um, and yeah, it was so insightful. Again, this is the first time that I see Apex. So it was great to see how it looks it's like. A lot of information. I know, I know. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, inter it's interesting. Um, and I'll be happy to do more things uh, later on. Uh, and probably we can just do another uh, within a specific thing. Uh, and I'll be more more prepared for explaining what, I, what I'm doing. But uh, thank you so much again for, for having me here and, and, and for everyone to, that joined. So yeah. Thank you. So I don't think we got any more followers. No, we didn't. 
but we are two followers away from being 400 in Twitch. So remember to go to twitch.tv slash mulesoft underscore community and follow us there so we can have more people. Why do you want to follow us on Twitch? Um, because we have all of the previous recordings and you can get um, notifications in your phone if you install the application as soon as we are live so you don't miss us. And Johnny is saying just followed. Yay, Man. I see it. Okay, we are one follower away <laughs> from being 400 followers on Twitch. So thank you so much to everyone that's following us. Thank you, Johnny. Um, and I will see you on Thursday at 10.30 a.m. ET. Awesome. And that's it. I think the next one is going to be co Composer. Composer, yeah. So... Stay tuned for that. We have only done one composer before. This is going to be the second stream on composer. So, yeah, we will see you on Thursday then. Thank you, Edgar. Awesome. All right. Thank you. See you guys. Bye.